Hello everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge and welcome to this week's reading wrap up. We are at week 25 of 2021, which is just crazy. Like, I can't even imagine it. It is early Saturday morning like it usually is and I'm not gonna lie, I'm having a fantastic hair day. Like, my hair did everything I asked of it and more and I'm kind of obsessed so don't mind me if I'm just staring at myself and I'm drinking my protein powder coffee. I got this cool protein powder and I like shake it with my cold brew and then I add milk and uh, sweetener to it and it tastes amazing. It's good because I just wasn't in the mood for breakfast yet. You know how that is? Okay, I know you're not here for this. We're here for the books. Um, I'm very excited. There was some wonderful books that I read this week. There was also some weird ones that I read this week. So let's go ahead and get into those. Okay, so where did I just put it? Oh, put it back here. <laughs> the first one that I want to talk about was a buddy read that I read with my friend Avery from Avery Loves Books. Um, Avery and I have been friends for, I mean, over a year now. Wow. Um, she's one of the sweetest humans ever. So if you haven't checked out her channel, please do it. She is one of the OG Ice Planet Barbarian lovers. She's read most of Ruby Dixon's books. Um, and she's just a really, really sweet human. So I highly encourage you to go check out her channel. I'll link her down below. But I try every month to do a buddy read with one of my friends here on YouTube or not. Um, you know, I do have other friends. It's strange, but true. Um, and we picked a Kathy Maxwell, and this one is If Ever I Should Love You. And it's the first book in the Spinster Heiresses series. So I ended up giving this book three and a half stars, and it had a lot going for it, and it had a lot that went wrong. So this book is a kind of second chance romance. Um, this girl is now a spinster and her family needs her to marry and her name is Leone and our hero's name is uh it literally doesn't say it just says that he's inherited a title so the Earl of Rochdale and he has some history with Leone um where he saved her from an assault she was already been assaulted, but he saved her from another one, and she killed the man who assaulted her, and he took the blame. And then her family spirited her away from where they were, because I, I don't know if they were um, stationed in... They were stationed in another country, um, and she's lived with the shame. It has caused Leone to become an alcoholic. Um, her family doesn't really... They don't fully know what happened to her because we covered up this lie and um, she never has told the truth about what happened. So she's just shoved it down with alcohol. So this book took on some very serious topics. You know, it has trauma. It has off-page rape. It has, you know, murdering someone. Um, and then it has alcoholism. And I just don't feel that any one of those topics, which would have been enough to talk about, I don't feel like any one of them got the proper space that I needed. I feel like if you're going to take on some of these things, then we needed to be more about that. I really did like the hero in this, um, but then the way that he would react, and I get it because they don't fully understand alcoholism maybe at this time, and like, let alone having a woman be the alcoholic is so different. But it just rubbed me the wrong way. It didn't work for me. This was my first first Kathy Maxwell. I will try more of them. I own quite a bit of them for particularly their step backs. Because look at that. That's beautiful. But this, particularly for me, as I've shared in the past, alcoholism, it's not a trigger for me. I am not happy to read about it. But it doesn't hurt me to read about it. But it is also something that I have experience with, with a loved one, being an alcoholic, and the way that it's handled for Leone was just completely unimaginable for me. Like I was like, no, that, that, no, that's not how 
you would handle this or what it would look like for the person who is the alcoholic. Just absolutely not. Um, that might not affect other people the way that it did me just because it's an area I have knowledge in. However, there are books like, again, The Magic, which is one of my favorite books of all time that has an alcoholic character. And I feel like his recovery was treated in a way that I respected because it was truthful to what I had seen. So not everyone's the same. I'm just saying that I feel like for the tough topics that the author was taking on, she kind of let a lot of them fall flat for me. So that's why like the first half of this book was a four or four and a half star. And then the way that we resolved everything brought it down to three and a half for me. Cause I was like, Ooh, we kind of just f face planted there. Um, then I read Forever Lies by Jill Ramsomhauer. Ram, Ramsomhauer? Ramsomhauer. This is an author that I've been seeing a lot of you mention to me. I know there's one that um, I think is, I don't know, there's, there's, there's one specifically by her that keeps getting recommended because of the hardware down there when I did that video. Jill Ramsomhauer came up a lot in that one. So I definitely will be checking that one out. I have it on my Kindle. But this was one that I had gotten um, for free and then I got the $7 upgrade for the audio. So this one was she falls in love with a mafia guy. He's there kind of like investigating her dad's company. She works at her dad's company. She has an abusive boss and her dad has kind of missed it. Um, and they start a relationship and she doesn't know that he's involved in the mafia and when she finds out, she's going to have something to say about it, like you do. I'll be honest, this one just felt kind of forgettable in comparison to a lot of other Mafia that I've read and we'll even talk more about in this last week. So I gave this a four star because it was enjoyable when I was doing it. The hero was very protective and obsessive, almost a bit stalkery, which I'm not saying that in mind. But... I've just seen better, right? I have pretty high standards for Mafia at this point, if I do say so myself. Um, then I read His Cocky Valet by Cole McCade. And I saw this one on a TikTok about, I think it was male male romances. Um, this one is an age gap and it is between a young um, businessman who his father is very ill and so his son is kind of being forced to take over everything because his father is sick. And he gets a valet. It's suggested that he get a valet um, to help handle things for him. And so our young man, he's only like 23 and his valet is 40. And this valet is there to take care of all of his needs. <laughs> and uh, there is a bit of... So something that I really appreciated because this had a little bit of like daddy kink aspects or like DG, DB would it be? I don't know. Daddy little boy. I don't know. DDLB. Let's call it that. <laughs> daddy Dom little boy. But they didn't use those monikers. There was still, um, or they didn't use those honorifics. There was still um, safe words in place. There was still this amazing like caregiving aspect of it but they didn't want to use those titles for each other, um, which I kind of liked because I'll be honest, one of the aspects that can be too much in Daddy King for me is when they say daddy all the time. You know the ones I mean. You know the ones I mean. Like, I don't mind if it's there now and then because that can be fun. Um, but sometimes it, if it's a, like, DG, LG, or, you know, one of those scenarios, it can be, like, a lot. But this one was really about the caregiving and it's this stoic, tough, sassy, cocky, that's where the name comes from, older valet who his life is service and he's the, you know, he's the dominant in this situation and he helps keep this young man in line so that he can live his best potential everywhere else. And I really I liked it a lot. I gave this five stars. And then I also gave his cocky valet 1.5, which was, if you signed up for the newsletter, you could get it. But it was 65 pages, so I counted it, and I gave that five stars as well. And I loved it a lot. Like, it was great. 
Um, then I finished John Eyre by Mimi Matthews. This book comes out, does it come out the end of June? I think it comes out the end of June. This is a Jane Eyre gender swapped retelling mixed with another classic which I won't say if you go to the Goodreads page you'll see people who are saying what it is connected with um but I won't say it in this because I don't want to spoil it if you want to read it a couple things I just wouldn't consider this a romance like by the technical definition because you know I'll be technical about it it does have an HEA for everyone involved so it's not that it's just that there was so little time spent on the romance between Bertha Rochester because we have swapped and uh, Edward Rochester is the crazy one. Like, that's how everything is switched out. And John Eyre is the tutor to two of Bertha's wards, okay? So the first, like, 60% of this book is a pretty much straight, gender-swapped retelling of Jane Eyre, which I wasn't mad about, but I was bored. Because interspersed with this are letters from Bertha's point of view, writing to her friend Blanche Ingram, so that's kind of cool. Blanche gets to be someone's friend because it's gender swapped. And talking about how she gets drawn in by Edward. Um, you know, so the same thing that was like happening to Mr. Rochester where he was, he fell in love with this fun, beautiful woman, Bertha, and then it switched. That's kind of what's happening to her in these letters. But it made the book feel, and what I discovered when I got to the author's note at the end of this book, the author meant it to be more about Bertha, and she meant this to be a representation of like giving Bertha Rochester a Me Too mo moment. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just not what I was sold when I picked up the book. So I want to be honest to you. This did not fit the normal historical romance aspects I was looking for. This was in the romance category on NetGalley because there's an HEA, but there is, there is more romance in the original Jane Eyre than there was in this retelling. And that was a disappointment to me because I was excited to get this swap and I was excited for it to be spicier and more exciting and yeah. I also didn't appreciate the other classic that was put into the story. So I gave this three stars because I was being nice and content wise it probably is a three star but I was hoping for so much more. Maybe that's my problem. Maybe I shouldn't have such high expectations for things. Okay then a book we've all been waiting for or at least me. I got to read The Bully a couple days early. So sweet Sophie who when this video is going up I will have already talked to her Part of the reason I got so fancy today is tonight on my channel, which will have already happened when you're seeing this, um, Sophie Lark is going to have an interview with me and Jessen and uh, Tiffany, and I'm so excited that she said yes to this. I am just thrilled. Thrilled. But I got to read The Bully a couple days early because she invited me onto her ARC team. Thank you. And... This was a six star book, okay? This book is already out for you guys as well. Um, because I read it on Monday and it came out on Wednesday. And I was gobsmacked by how intelligent, exciting, sexy, and delightful that this entry into the Kingmakers was, okay? For all that I bitched, for all that I bitched about the air because I had problems with the air that Dean's POV was included. In The Rebel, I didn't mind so much because Kat was okay and I was interested in what was happening. Sophie didn't do that for no reason because she was able to start the character basis off without having to waste that time in this book, you know? We were able to see Dean, we could see peaks at his softer side and his like the way his brain was working and how he wants someone to be obsessed with him, how he wants someone to love him. And then in this book, we get to see more about what his family life has been. You know, it's just his dad. His dad is an agoraphobic and has slipped down into madness and nothing Dean does is good enough. You know, that relationship is just so broken. 
It's so broken. Um, his mother abandoned them and he's alone, you know? And when he goes to Kingmakers, this year specifically, there is some crazy changes. First off, he is going to be yanking Kat's chain and other parts of her body around because he knows a secret, you know, and if you haven't read the previous two books, I don't just want to spoil it, but he knows a secret and he has leverage and he's going to use that leverage to have someone be at his beck and call. And that's a fine setup for a bully romance in like in any, you know, story you're going to tell. But now that I know more about Dean's psychology and why he's like this, it becomes clear that half the reason he wants this control is that he's tired of being alone. And if he has to coerce that relationship, then he will. Okay. And then we have Kat who has mostly been forgotten. She's been a pawn. She has been, you know, neglected in certain aspects. And then there's this guy, Dean, who knows her secret. Her biggest act of bravery she ever has done this far has created this scenario where she's under his control, but she's more than willing to go along with it. Not only because he holds her future in his hand, that's a convenient excuse for her. Oh, I'm doing this because he's making me. But really, to be the focus of Dean Yenin's complete attention and to be his possession in some aspects is more than she bargained for and everything she needs to become the woman that she's meant to be. So, I will also add this book has one of the best grovels I've ever read. The alpha male doing what he does in this book for his woman to ask forgiveness is one of the best that I've ever read, okay? And now, I know a lot of people are getting excited. You, you probably are. <laughs> I know I am. Um, the setup for the spy is amazing. We never find out his name yet. We don't know who it, maybe it is a woman. <laughs> maybe it's not even a girl. <laughs> well, it probably is a man because the cover of the spy has a man on it. But Sophie is just brilliant. And I'm in awe. And I can't wait to talk to her tonight and pick her brain. Like, I'm just so excited. But this was a six star read for me. No question. I absolutely adored it. I loved it. Then I read His Cocky Cellist by Cole McGain, which is the second book in the duology. And this is about um, a friend of the guy from the first one who believes he's straight. And then he meets this cellist who is a dominant and a masseuse and a very talented cellist artist. Um, and they begin interactions where he discovers that, yes, he's very turned on by this cellist. And maybe my sexuality isn't as cut and dry as I thought it was. And it was fun. This one was a four star for me because while well, the cellist, I can't remember, I think Armani is his name. He was a bit much for me. There, he was pretty great, but there, there just some of it is not totally my kink and it wasn't fully worked. So this one does have BDSM in it and, um, yeah. It was still good. And if you read the first one, you're going to read the second one. I just, I had such a connection with his cocky ballet that like his cocky cellist just, we're splitting the hairs here, but it just wasn't the same. Then I read The CEO of Christo by Sophie Lark for reasons I have already stated. Um, she has three standalones. Um, the... There's one called Always, the CEO of Christo and um, Starlet. And I wanted to read at least one of those. Tiffany read one of the other ones. And I just wanted to try one of her standalones. And this is a retelling of The Count of Monte Cristo. If you can't tell from the cover and the name of it. Um, and this was very interesting. I ended up giving it four stars. Enjoyment level might have been a 3.5. Because even though, so this is set in like modern times, it's set with when these 
people are in college, they're working on this idea for a tech company, there is this nerdy, smart guy who is like the brains behind a lot of stuff, and then there is um, the other guy, and they're both interested in this girl at a party, and one of them asks to buy her a drink first, and then the other one is the one who kisses her at midnight because it is New Year's Eve, and those two end up together. And it's five years down the road or something, and their company is making it big, and that other guy is still obsessed with the girl. And I'm sorry I'm saying guy and girl, I can't remember their names in this, I'm sorry. And he murders someone and is able to blame it on his friend. And so he goes to prison for eight years. I can't remember how many years it is. It's not the full like 13 like happens in the Count of Monte Cristo, but he goes to prison. And then it, some of it, I did like that the treasure, the Cristo, the Count of Monte Cristo treasure this time is Bitcoin <laughs> because our hero, he saves someone's life in prison and as a gift, that friend gives him a Bitcoin that he has and so when he gets out of prison, he goes to cash it in and it's millions of dollars now. And so he's going to take down this whole company and take down everyone. But what he doesn't know, because he was encouraged not to tell, like she was encouraged not to tell him, is that that woman who loved him, she had his child while he was there. But he refused to see her so she couldn't tell him. So you guys know how I feel about uh, that trope. However, I did find that for a certain aspect it worked for me because our hero in prison literally refused to ever speak to her because he wanted her to move on and he didn't want to feel like he didn't want to feel like she was waiting for him because he didn't know if he would ever get out, you know. So in that aspect, it's literally like, well, how was she supposed to tell him? Like he wouldn't accept her letters or her call. And then we had that friend who's the one who actually murdered the guy whispering in her ear and being like, you don't want, it'll just be too hard for him. He's going to be in prison forever. Um, so yeah, I gave it four stars still. If you love the Count of Monte Cristo, I think you'll really enjoy this. Um, but it, it definitely doesn't have the same smoothness of telling that some of her other books do. And I don't know if that's because it's a standalone or just because there was a lot of beats that she was trying to hit. I don't know. Um, but also I'm just more attached to her mafia. But this was fun. It was good. There was an opportunity I felt like for a crossover between the mafia because the one guy gets in trouble with the Russian mob and I was like, oh my god, it's an opportunity for the Petrovs. But it didn't happen. So, who knows. All right, then I read Unveiled by Courtney Milan. This was our book club pick of the month and it looks like nobody read it with me, <laughs> but that's okay, it happens. Um, the spinner wheel picks the book and if it's not one that lots of people wanted, then it's just me reading the book and giving updates about it, but that's okay. This is the first book in the Turner series, you know, and we did, part of it was is that we did um, read Unveiled near the beginning of the year or I mean we read Unclaimed which is about the brother of Mark um or of the okay this is Ash Turner that was Mark Turner so in this one um Ash wants to seek revenge against the guy who ruined his family and he intends to take his rightful place as heir to the dukedom and so literally he moves into this home while the old duke is dying there and he has a daughter named lady margaret who's hiding her identity so she's pretending to be a servant so that she could stay there and look after her father this definitely has a trigger warning for terminal illness of a parent and also like verbal abuse from a parent because he just spews vitriol and it's clear that he's hated his kids even before like even before um he was ill. Like, he's just a shitty human. Because what happened is that I think he wasn't actually married to the mom. I can't remember how, but I know that there is a reason that her and her brothers are um, considered not legitimate. And so that's what the, the war that's happening is that if they are um, seen to be illegitimate, then Mark, or then Ash is the heir. And so 
Lady Margaret is also kind of undercover to see if she can find out some dirty things about Ash. But she very quickly is drawn into him because Ash is just a good man. Like, he plays it tough, but he cares. And even when, because for most of this book, he thinks she's a servant, he treats her with respect. He definitely wants to get under her skirts, but he is so, like thoughtful towards her and kind to her and the way that he builds her up is so amazing and I said this in some updates to my friends is and I think I said it on like my Goodreads updates too is there was this anxious weight on my chest that when he found out who she was that he was gonna just freak out and he does freak out but he does not freak out at her and it is a case of like a hero who when he understands the full lay of the land, he is so angry on behalf of our heroine and the life that she's have to live. And he turns his eyes towards pursuing her. Now, she definitely fights that. She fights it a lot. Because if she were to marry him, Parliament, the people voting on the legitimacy might see it like, oh, well, this bloodline will continue through her if she marries him, so we don't need to make these brothers legitimate. And so she's like, I can't do that to my brothers. I can't make them be illegitimate. Even though her brothers probably wouldn't give her the same courtesy. So I just love this. There's just something about the men in this series thus far, both Ash and mark who are feminists like they are male feminists <laughs> in the time period that they live which time is this one in um let me look sorry 1837 because the respect that they have for women and the way that they look at them is so beautiful like it is beautiful um that wasn't just a Mark Turner thing. It's cool in this one because Mark is writing his book on male chastity, which is what Unclaimed is about. And I just love it. This also has a hero who's dyslexic. Ash is dyslexic and um, for the most part illiterate because he's so dyslexic that like no one has known how to teach him. You know, that's part of the thing is that because he was a working kid, he's a self-made man. Um, he didn't go to school and even if he had, his mind messes everything up so much that he probably wouldn't have been able to learn to read anyway because nobody had the tactics to teach it. So this book has some amazing things it takes on and I'm only more excited to read more Courtney Milan. Courtney Milan. I'll be reading the third book in this series for the Historical Romance Readathon and I'm so excited because it's a really beautiful series. I gave this four and a half stars by the way. I took off a half star because the heroine just didn't get with the party quick enough for me which can irritate me then I read the fake king's dream by Jamie Schlosser I was so happy to discover that this series had two more books out in it already um, I really loved from dawn to dusk and then the fake kings uh, what was the first one the fake kings bride I can't remember what the first book was but I read those way back and um, I love them, but they were the only two that were out in this series, the prequel and the first one. And because of a recent video I made, I looked up this author and I realized she had two more books out. So I read The Fae King's Dream, um, which in this world, all of the Fae Kings, um, or the heirs to the throne at the time, are cursed to be blind until they find their fated mate. And they cannot kiss anyone but their fated mate, but they can't see them. And the way that the Fae discover their fated mate is they like look in their eyes and then they're their bond will like snap in place kind of thing and they're blind and so they're not able to see and you know and they can't kiss anyone else but their true love or else they will lose the chance to see like they would still might find their fated mate but they wouldn't be able to see so in this one our hero is a dream walker and his parents have been trying to help him find his fated mate for a long, long time because he can dream walk into the mind of, or into the dreams of a person if he owns, if he has something um, precious to them. And when he's in the dream world, he can see. Um, he just can't see in the real world. And so his parents have helped him find his love, but she is in a coma. 
because she was in a car accident, her parents died, and she's in a coma. So he has to find her, use a portal to get her, and bring her back to um, the Fey realm so that she can be healed and then they can be together. So this was a thrill ride. I gave this four stars. The first half of this book is very strong. It's very romantic. They're so beautiful together. Oh, I just love it. These books are sexy and they have all the fantasy you could want. There's all the magic there is in a fae world. You know, it, people have different powers and it's really amazing. The, the part was the second half of it drug a little bit and there was a few like crazy you know, magical things going on. And so I got a teensy bit bored, but I really enjoyed myself. I'm currently reading the fourth one. I took a little bit of a break because there was, you know, just other things going on, but I did enjoy myself quite a bit. Then I read Glass Slipper by Kay Webster. I should have grabbed that because I actually just give, got given this, but, um, this is the third and final book in the, um, Cinderella trilogy by Kay Webster and I had actually started this book quite a while ago and then I didn't finish it because I just wasn't in the mood but after I read Lessons in Sin last week I realized that all the Dangerous Press books were connected through the Winstons and or not through the Winstons this hero's name is Winston through the Constantines and the Morellis and I was like shit I need to get back on this and I'm really glad that I did because you get to see the characters from the other books and now that I know that I'm gonna finish reading all the rest of them in this series like it's gonna happen we're gonna do it so this one is about um Winston and Ashley I think I think that's her name and this was a kind of like degradation relationship with like um, money involved and there's just a whole bunch too much to explain I gave this four stars um, there's a pretty crazy like our antagonist he has his own series I guess written by one of the other authors in it so I'll definitely be checking that out um, but yeah I mean it's Kay Webster she's great the sex is dirty and I definitely enjoyed it more now knowing how all the people connect and knowing that like like Tinsley was like in one of the scenes and I was like oh my god <laughs> I know it's gonna happen to her <laughs> so it was definitely more fun now that I like knew that was happening then I read Devil May Care by Amelia Wilde and this was a release that I was really looking forward to I have the other two just right here so I'll show you it's the third book in this series come on why does this happen it's shiny and matte stay consistent please please stay consistent so this is the end in that trilogy which Kind of the beginning of it reminded me like a sea of ruin um in the second one we had some things happen where i felt like the hero really groveled really good for me <laughs> but then something devastated happened at the end of that one and so where we pick up in this one we have ashley <laughs> again <laughs> um that might be why i'm confusing them i doubt they're both ashley but anyway um we had ashley and uh poseidon this is also a Poseidon retelling kind of thing. And Hades and Zeus do make an appearance in this one. And he backslid a lot. And for books that are only about 200 pages each, I really hope that in our third act he was going to be different. But he was backslid for quite a bit of the story. And it was extremely frustrating for me. So this one ended up being a four star because, you know, the ending wrapped up really sweet. Um, and I feel like if I were to read it all in a single arc now, that would be better because now you can read all three at once and they make up, you know, like one regular book size. But yeah, it was tough for me. It was tough because I just, I wanted the third book to be about how they were going forward to each other and still he was like backslid for a while. Then I read Undercover Attraction by Katie Robert. I'm so happy that I was finishing up this series because right now Katie Robert is writing the um, second generation of the O'Malley's and I've owned her books for a while and Libby actually had um, all of them on audiobook. So I went for it. So this one is about Charlotte Finch, who's an ex-cop because she was framed for being a dirty cop and like no one believed her, not even her dad, who is also... A cop he's actually an organized crime investigator and so she was framed as a dirty cop by Dmitri Romanov and 
Aiden O'Malley, um, who is currently the boss, because his father has taken early retirement, you know, to go spend the rest of his time with his wife, um, he needs her help to get back at Romanoff. So he asks her to be involved in a fake engagement with him for reasons so that they can enact this plan. Um, so yeah, so this was fake dating, enemies to lovers, very sexy. It's one of those where it's like we're enemies and we're fake dating and we better have sex to make it real because people need to think we're totally into each other for him to have decided to marry this woman so quickly. So this was great. I gave this four stars. I had a wonderful time. I love, these are still so sexy. Like I forgot that her books with forever are still as sexy as they are. Like this was still absolutely delightful. So if you love the mafia, you definitely need to check out Katie Roberts mafia series, especially because just from the hints of what she's writing in the second gen series, you're going to want to read those. And I think it will be best if you've read these first. Then I read Blackmailing My Dad's BF by S.E. Law. This was one I still had on my Kindle that I bought when it was free. Um, another one I'd read by her was um, my, my fiancé's dad. Um, but this one literally is um, this girl and her dad. Her dad has a best friend who is the same age as him. And he's been writing... Um, fantasies kind of about his goddaughter who's recently turned 18 and so he like writes them down to be kind of cathartic and she's had a crush on him for a while and now that she's 18 and old enough she wants to make a move and then she finds his journal and realizes he's thinking about her too so she decides to blackmail him with it and it doesn't take much convincing for him to start fucking her so I gave this three stars specifically for their first sex scene happens with her dad in the room sleeping. They're watching a movie together and he's fallen asleep in the chair and she climbs on him and straddles him on the couch and they fuck right there. I'm sorry. I can let my brain forget a lot, but to do that in the room with your dad there is so disgusting to me that I was like what like it would be one thing if it was in the same house but literally if your dad woke up your dad would see you fucking someone no no then I read Link by Serena Ackroyd and sweet Serena was kind enough to actually send this to me I have it personalized um as a thank you for talking about her books all the time, <laughs> which was so sweet. She was like, I know that you have all of the filthy books, but would you like one of these? And she offered me NYX and I kindly declined saying that I've already read NYX and I hate his guts. And she, <laughs> I did say that to her and she was like, I get that a lot. I understand. I'll send you a link. So she sent me this and it's so beautiful. She recovered these, um, recently and the recovers, I love this and I love the spine. And so I'm really happy that I got to read this. Um, however, I did have some issues with this. Um, so this one, oh, she does tell such beautiful story. It isn't the story that I have a problem with. So the beginning of this book starts with picking up kind of where we left off last time. There was this guy who's a total asshole who is dealing in human trafficking and he has a sister who's been being abused by both him and their father as in like she gets raped by her dad as punishment um but her brother got killed in the last book by the heroine of that book and the women that he had purchased we can't find them and so our heroine in this book um lily she has discovered where they are. And so at great risk to herself, she goes to one of the MC's bars and gets in contact with Link and says, this is where the women are. And they don't really trust her, but she's like, you don't have anything to lose. Please go. I can't go myself. And so they go and they find one dead girl and the other three very malnourished and sick um, and dying because no one's been taking care of them and they're emaciated and it's horrible and so now that she's proven herself truthful they 
form they have each other's phone number and they have this texting relationship um and the biggest issue that I had with this is that she has some trauma she's working through obviously she's been raped by her dad it's very difficult for her to be in a sexual situation and Link is so patient and sweet and it's absolutely beautiful but there's no like mutual sex in this book he gives her oodles of orgasms which is wonderful and Link I don't have any problems with Link but we don't work through their issues in this book and so this is a pretty short book the last um, 30 pages of this book are actually the beginning of Filthy. So this book is only 240 pages. Serena Ackroyd knows how to write big books. I'm reading the next book in this series and we still see Link and Lily and they still haven't had sex yet. And like, I get it from one aspect of like, yes, I want her to work through her trauma. Like I love sexual healing and I love seeing that happen. But for me, this isn't a complete book then because we didn't work through our trauma in the book that's about them. So this series shouldn't really have like individual stories in it because the thing she does with POV, the only full sex scene in this is about Nyx and Gianna, who I fucking hate. I hate them. I don't want to see them having sex in this book that's about Link and Lily. I don't understand. So it's difficult for me because this author is one of my favorite authors. She sent me this wonderful book and I like the story arc overall, but like as a reviewer, when I'm holding up this book, I'm talking about this book on its merits alone. And for me, this isn't a complete story because you haven't had the complete arc of healing for those characters, okay? This book should have been bigger then and included them at least getting to the point where they're able to work through those issues together. And that doesn't happen. And reading Sin, the next book, they're working on their sexual trauma, but that book's about Sin and his woman. Why am I still having to wait for my satisfaction for these characters in a different book, you know? So that's my mini rant about this. I have the, you know, on my Kindle, I have the pack of the first six, and I'm like, well, I don't feel like you should have named these individually and have them be that way if the full character arc isn't in this book. Then the next book should be about Lily and like Link and Lily and make it a duet and have their arc go through two books. But the next book is about Sin and his woman and they have other stuff going on in that one. So ugh, it just didn't hit with me right. And I was sad about it because I shouldn't have to wait till a book that's about someone else to see that so I did give that three and a half stars and it hurt because Link is great but that's not a complete story it's not and I've read other books of hers that have other people's POVs that I get a complete arc for the characters in there so that's why I have the problem because I know she can do it and do it very well and this one didn't so that's where we're at with it then I read Everything I Can Never Have by M. Johnson. This is another um, dad's best friend. She's 19 or something. Um, he's getting a divorce because his wife cheated on him. Um, her dad has like went to Europe and he's gone. And so he asked her to look out for him. So they're sharing a house and he purposely is making sure he's never home when she's home because he's extremely attracted to her and stuff happens. So... It was good. This whole series is a like forbidden romances one and I enjoy it quite a lot. I give it four stars. Then I read The Bastard's Bargain by Katie Robert, finished off the O'Malley series. This one is the couple we've all been waiting for. It's Kira O'Malley and Dimitri Romanoff. We've been watching their romance build for the last three books. He was originally um, engaged to Kerrigan, one of the other siblings and when that went south Kira the youngest was engaged to him this book deals with drug and alcohol addiction um it deals with withdrawals and um the all the aspects that go with that I feel like Katie handled that very deftly with the cravings still being there and with the slip up still happening and stuff like that Dimitri is completely obsessed with this woman. We've known he's been obsessed for the past couple books and he's lying to him, himself saying how much that he's obsessed with her, but he's gone for her. And something that I absolutely love is that he is looking for a partner 
And Kira doesn't believe that. She's like, I'm just here to be his arm candy, but I'm going to do it because I want my family to be safe. And he's like, I have so much more planned for you than you to just be my arm candy. Also, this book is hot as hell. As I've been saying, this book was delightful. The audiobook was wonderful. Mm, Dimitri, mm, this was five stars. And then the last one I want to talk about just real quickly because this is getting too long. I read Push by Nyla Kay. I was intrigued by this. So this book came up in the monthly spinner wheel. Um, someone recommended it for the spinner wheel and it didn't win. But I looked up the premise of it and I was like, oh shit, I'm going to read it. So it's about this couple, Jessica and Ben, and their daughter Haley is bringing home a boy for Thanksgiving, Ryan. He's 21. While he's there, Ben and Ryan end up fucking. After knowing each other for two days, they're watching a movie downstairs, they both get drunk, and they start blowing each other, and then they start fucking the whole weekend. Um, and then they're obsessed with each other. And then Jessica, he breaks, so Ryan breaks up with Haley because he's like, wow, I'm having feelings, this is crazy, I'm gonna break up with her. Well then Jessica, the wife, finds out about this affair and she joins in on it. So this becomes a menage. And I thought that the idea was intriguing. I mean, this is a call, it's a forbidden taboo romance for all the reasons we said. Neither one of them even knew they were bisexual. And after knowing each other for two days and being drunk, they started fucking. And that is the crux of the matter for me, that that just happened. And then also the rampant cheating on this. Ben is supposedly so into his wife, but the idea of this forbidden thing with Ryan just literally makes him start raw, raw fucking this guy who is dating his daughter, okay? And then within two weeks, we're jumping to the love word, and then we're thinking about the three of us being together, and then when things don't go well, Ryan wants comfort, so he's fucking another guy. So there was just so many levels of cheating and so many things that I had to whistle past that I understand why people thought I might, like, you know, wanted to see my opinion. And here's my opinion. Like, it was spicy, but the story was like, what? Like, I just couldn't be invested in these people that supposedly this 19-year marriage that is strong and they have great sex still, that it would take just a little bit of alcohol for him to start blowing his boyfriend, her, his, his daughter's boyfriend, and then to love him. I mean, I don't read romance just for trash guys. Like, I need the story to also make sense for me. And this one was just erotica. It has an HEA, but this was just erotica. And I was hoping for more from the story than that. Maybe that's my fault. So I gave this three stars. Maybe it was kind of generous. I was feeling generous last night. So, all right, there you go. Those are all the books that I read in week 25. Um, let me know which ones you're interested in reading. Tell me what you read last week, what you loved. Um, yeah, thank you so much for watching. If you want more videos, you can see some of them right now. Bye.